Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about solving the climate crisis with John Berger, who is author of the book Solving the Climate Crisis, Frontline Reports from the Race to Save the Earth. John Berger, thank you for coming on Talk World Radio. Oh, it's my pleasure, David. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having written this terrific book as well, Solving the Climate Crisis. Um, There's not universal agreement on whether that's possible anymore. Can we solve the climate crisis? And would you tell us if we couldn't? I mean, if it were (laughs) if it were hopeless, we would all know that more people would do more good work to slow and mitigate the damage if they believed it wasn't hopeless. So would you go with honesty or would you uh, (laughs) you encourage more activism? I will will definitely go with honesty, especially in this case, because we do have all of the technology that we need and all of the financial resources to solve this problem. And we can provide all of our energy services without fossil fuels through clean, efficient, renewable, profitable, and increasingly affordable new energy technologies. So I'm very optimistic um, that we have what it takes to do the job. Well, I guess I've known that we could technologically, uh, or, or, or that we're capable in changing our lifestyle, that, we, that there are many ways we could, uh, but can we get these rotten governments and, and and major institutions to do it? Seems like a different question. I I, I read Naomi Klein's recent book uh, in which she said that she asked you what you thought of her previous book, The Shock Doctrine, and you said that calmness was a form of resistance to people pushing fear and panic. And, <laughs> and I, I wonder if you could explain that to listeners, because I think we need uh, a lot more fear and panic. We need people nonviolently shutting down governments until they completely reverse their ways, not blissfully watching sports and going shopping. I think there might be a little bit of confusion. And I don't think I've ever actually had this conversation with Naomi Klein, but she might have read something that I wrote. Tell you the truth, I really don't remember writing that, but I could have written it, and I very likely. Different John Berger. Um, I am. I'm John Berger, unless she was thinking of the other late John Berger, the British Marxist art critic. So it's possible that that's who she was referring to. But okay. let me let me just make a distinction here. I don't think that not panicking is the same as remaining complacent. I think that being calm, centered, and logical and avoiding panic and despair is exactly what we need in a crisis. And I think that you have to be able to do your best thinking and choose the most effective strategy and tactics in a crisis. I think that fear and panic are good friends with despair and that the fossil fuel industry really wants us to uh, become hopeless, to throw up our hands and become demoralized and then disengage from the issue and from the struggle of converting from fossil fuels to clean energy. To me, that that's very logical and um, we could we could go further into that down that rabbit hole but it it's really clear to me that we don't want despair or panic but what we want is really sober thoughtful action currently by contrast it's as if our house is on fire we are instead of pulling the fire alarm breaking that glass and calling the fire department and then training um like hoses on the flames, we're throwing gasoline on the fires of climate change and expecting that the fires are gonna go out. We are hitting all time highs in our national oil and gas production, for example. 
at the same time we're talking about um, solving the climate crisis. But yeah, well, that makes sense. There's there's uh, some grim statistics in the early pages of your book. By 2070, if current trends continue, you write 19% of the Earth's land will be uninhabitably hot. Uh, if, if that's true... Let me qualify that for a minute, sure. if I may break in, because sure. I don't want people right now to jump out the window and, you know, break the glass and pull the fire alarm. I think that what I'm saying there is it's a combination of heat and high humidity that cause the wet bulb temperature to reach something like 30 degrees centigrade. And if and that, that would be for a period of time every year or so. And we've seen these triple digit heat waves. We had a high pressure area over parts of Europe, parts of the Middle East and Africa in um, the summer of 2022. And people die in these heat waves. In fact, going back to 1997, something like 160,000 excess deaths have likely been caused by um, heat waves in the United States alone. But I think I'm possibly wandering away from your question about this, um, this um, crisis globally when one to three billion people will be in areas that um, for some part of the year will really be uns have unsurvivable temperatures that will cause body temperatures to reach in, in your in inner core temperature to reach 104 degrees um, Fahrenheit and thereby you wouldn't be able to sustain even a moderate level of physical activity and if you didn't have a way of cooling off um, air conditioning or getting out of the heat you could um, very easily go into heat exhaustion and then progressive progress to heat stroke and death. So this is a very, very serious issue. And it's just one indication that we cannot continue on this current path and that we have to solve this crisis. It is an existential crisis. And it's, it's an existential crisis in another respect too, because if we hit a global temperature of two degrees centigrade and sustain that for a while, one in five land animals on earth and about a third of all insect species are projected to go extinct. So we would have widespread ecological collapse and we cannot endure as a civilization if we have widespread ecological collapse that will cause chaos. We'll have chaos long before that on this current path. We're already seeing signs of chaos due to climate change. Climate change is like a force multiplier that intensifies all of our environmental, social, and political problems. We're seeing it right now on the border as we have masses of refugees clamoring to get in or getting into the United States. And many of these people are fleeing intolerable drought conditions in Central or South America. And when you have drought, um, you don't have enough water for your crops. There's famine. People have to abandon crops. Livestock dies. People go to the cities. They find that there are no real economic alternatives uh, for them there. So then they, in desperation, migrate and show up on the borders of other countries that are not as hot and dry and impoverished. So we have to address the root causes of these problems. The root causes are not um, that we don't have good fences or border control. The root causes are that climate and other conditions are making life intolerable for people in, in many countries of the world.
But it seems like globally, we are neither taking the steps to avoid or slow this destruction, uh, nor figuring out what to do to resettle people elsewhere. Obviously, militarizing borders is not a solution, at least not for the people being locked out of the borders. We have we have endless uh, bickering over a one state or a two state solution in Palestine when it's clearly going to be a zero state solution unless uh, things are changed dramatically, right? I think that we can't begin to address the climate crisis as Americans by addressing, let's say, problems in Africa or problems in the Middle East. We have to start where we sit and where we stand. And we ought to be able to address the climate crisis in the United States, one of the most technologically advanced, if not the most technologically advanced nation, and certainly the wealthiest nation on the planet. We have the resources to do it, and we have the technology, but we don't have the political power to um, serve as a movement, as a counterweight to the political and economic power of the fossil fuel industry, which is a multi-trillion dollar global industry. Unless we build that countervailing political power in the United States, to pass the kinds of measures that I list in my book, Solving the Climate Crisis. We're not gonna address that, the, the crisis in the United States and we're not gonna have the moral authority to exhort other nations to follow um, sensible climate policies. We need to demonstrate how um, profitable and how efficient and how um, attractive uh, a clean energy economy is. This is actually the greatest economic opportunity of our time. It could save us trillions of dollars, it can create millions of new jobs, and it can avoid trillions of dollars in climate damage. But we have to demonstrate that, that it can be done. And I talk about areas of the world that have already gone a long, long way towards carbon neutrality. And cycling back, if I may, to your earlier question about is all hope lost? I, I want to make it very clear that despair is not only not productive in a sort of a pragmatic sense, but it's not called for because once we zero out our greenhouse gas emissions, the latest science indicates that in two to three years, global temperatures will begin falling and we can accelerate that fall after we reach zero net greenhouse gases by actually investing um, properly in natural climate solutions that increase the rate of absorption of carbon from the atmosphere into the soil and into the forests. On the contrary, what we're doing today is we're allowing the world to get so hot that these natural sources of uh, carbon storage become sources of carbon supply to the atmosphere. And that is beginning to happen shockingly to parts of the Amazon rainforest where untold quantities of carbon are now stored. So it's absolutely critically imperative that we implement sensible climate policies immediately. This is actually an emergency in which irrevocable changes are happening to the earth in terms of melting of Greenland or melting portions of the Antarctic ice sheet. So we have to stop this immediately because the longer it goes on, the worse the damage becomes. I think pretty clearly the United States, depending on how you measure it, uh, is near the top in terms of overall pile of money. It's, it, everybody calls it the wealthiest country, uh, but per capita, it just isn't the wealthiest country on earth. Everybody just 
pretends it is, but it does have lots of money. Uh, and th there's endless money in militarism. Uh, there's endless money uh, among the super wealthy. Uh, how would you go about uh, putting funds where they're needed? It's a great challenge, David. And if you look in the back of my book, Solving the Climate Crisis, you'll find that I've outlined 15 pages of policies, including tax reform policies. There are all kinds of sensible things to do that we do not have the political power today to implement. Among the tax reform policies that would provide more resources so we don't have to raise taxes in order to fund the clean energy transition. I suggest one of the least unpopular things we could do would be to provide more money to the IRS so that they can collect on their backlog unpaid taxes, especially from higher income people. I think that that could produce something like $7 trillion in wealth over a period of a decade. And there are other huge prospective pots of money that could be realized through less politically feasible mechanisms like a minimum wealth tax, for example, um, or a minimum income tax of let's say 20% on individuals who are making say $10 million a year. Uh, I'm not talking about hardship. I also um, would love to see a national carbon fee and dividend put in place because that would make fossil fuels relatively more expensive compared to cleaner alternative sources of energy. And those tax revenues could be rebated um, even disproportionately to lower and middle income Americans while also conserving some funding in order to um, advance the clean energy transition. Also popular among a majority of people in the US for many years has been taking money out of the military and putting it into something useful. Um, we just don't anticipate that ever happening uh, with the current uh, corrupt system of government we've got. What, a lot of what's in your book are examples of pe people doing great things at the state level and the city level and outside the United States where should we be putting our efforts, uh, especially if we think Washington uh, is hopeless? Uh, the fate of humanity may not be hopeless, but Washington, D.C. looks like the least likely place to accomplish anything. Um, I, wouldn't give, it, I wouldn't give up on Washington, D.C. I wouldn't concede that point to you. And I don't think that we're going to get anywhere by inveighing and you know, sharing our frustrations about corrupt government. But I think what we have to do, both for local effective action and for state and national effective action, is to create a much more uh, broad-based, multi-stakeholder political movement that really serves as a counterweight to the political and economic power of the fossil fuel industry. I cannot stress this enough. I feel that even though I'm a member of the environmental and the climate protection movement, and I support these organizations to the best of my ability and have been a 40 year member of the Sierra Club, I don't think that these organizations are speaking with one voice coherently enough. And I don't think they're really speaking the language of the American people. I think they're still addressing their constituencies. And I think that we have a National Wildlife Federation, we have a National Audubon Society, we have a Sierra Club, we have um, Earth Defense and the Natural Resources Defense Council. They've got to be able to agree on something really, really clear and really coherent that can serve as, in effect, the nucleus of an organizing platform that coalesces a vast national mass movement 
to address the climate crisis. We have to, for example, focus on what is driving this movement, this fossil fuel industry? What is fueling the fuel industry, if you will? And I think that it's clearly the, the financing from multinational banks since uh, 2015, when I attended the Paris Climate Conference. My understanding is that something like $1.9 trillion in funding has been provided to the fossil fuel industry for its further growth and expansion and um, general happiness. And I, I think that we have um, observed there are something like 195 massive carbon bomb style fossil fuel projects that are on the drawing boards or are already funded or under construction. If this is allowed to continue, it will unquestionably undermine global efforts to stay below um, two degrees centigrade, let alone one and a half degrees. So we have to address that financing. And if you want to build a mass movement, we have had very effective mass movements like the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement. We've gotten a million or more people out into the streets in Washington, DC, but we need that to happen. And we need people by the millions to demonstrate in the United States and to go to JP Morgan Chase or Wells Fargo or the other um, Citibank, the other banks that are providing the money for oil and coal and gas and let them know how people feel about it. And maybe the time is now to, to exert financial pressure on these institutions and to train the spotlight of public attention on it. We also have to educate the American people better and to get their attention. We're distracted so much. People are paying more attention to Taylor Swift's new outfit and to the NFL results than to something that threatens the future of the planet. Indeed. Uh, we're speaking with John Berger. The book is called Solving the Climate Crisis, Frontline Reports from the Race to Save the Earth. Um, it, it's, it seems like a lot of people have been working on getting local governments and universities and other institutions and investment funds to divest money from those uh, fossil fuel projects. Um, you're talking about taking our demands directly to the investors, uh, the banks. Um, what, uh, what approach or combination of approaches do you think uh, makes the most sense here? I, I think that we really need good political organizing by very experienced, astute organizers, people who have devoted their entire career to knowing how to organize and knowing how to advertise. It's a little bit above my pay grade, if I may say so. I, I know what has to be done and what has to happen, but I'm not in the trenches amongst the political organizers and the demonstrators. And I think that perhaps somebody like Bill McKibben, maybe, or Naomi Klein, maybe, might have better answers to that particular question. Uh, I, I think that when you act locally, though, you can have a greater impact. I, I, I can make a couple of general suggestions that maybe don't quite answer your question, but it's the best I can do. Namely, that I think we all need to show up to address this problem in our own way and that everybody can do something and that everybody needs to do something. An example of what everybody can do is register to vote and actually vote and then hold your representatives accountable. Make sure that you vote for people who have taken a stand on climate issues and then demand that they actually 
perform. And if they don't perform, vote them out of office and let them know well in advance what you're going to do. Um, write them repeatedly, call them, attend town hall meetings, show up at their offices. And that's one way where we can exercise our democratic um, freedom. And it's why democratic freedom is so important, because if we lose our democracy, we are going to lose the ability to protect the climate. There's absolutely no question in my mind about that. Dictatorships do not care about the environment, the climate, or people. They care about themselves and about exploiting the people that they rule. Well, that's certainly true, uh, but 350.org holding a big rally in Washington to say, dear President Obama, we love you. We're the people who elected you. No matter what you do, no matter what you destroy, we will reelect you. But could you please, please listen to us? It didn't prove particularly effective, and it's possible that uh, an approach that gets around the election trap and the, and the lesser evil trap um, may be needed at some point or may have long since been needed at some point. Um, I don't know. Um, but there, there's a there's a problem with the most important thing to do is vote if there's nobody worth voting for. Um, that, that's true. But David, to be devil's advocate here, please. when you have these big movements and big marches and rallies, it doesn't immediately translate into change that we desire. But it does educate people. It does change the climate of a public opinion. It does focus attention on the issues. This is a long term struggle, even though it's an emergency. No matter what we do, we're not going to fix this overnight. But we need to get on it as quickly as we can with all the resources that we can conceivably marshal to address it. Well, I certainly agree, and I and we've been talking so much about what to do, uh, and not enough, I think, about a lot of the stories that are in this book. Um, in the in the minutes that we have left, do you want to talk about some of the examples of what people are are doing in the areas of of agriculture and energy uh, that show great potential? We have um, agricultural. Uh, technology, as it were, which is really an ancient technology of uh, using cover crops and using livestock to graze the range and fertilize it, to minimize tillage, to um, basically always keep a, a live root in the soil, not allow it to lie fallow. Um, and to, um, by incorporating uh, both uh, animal husbandry and um, rangeland management and the use of compost, you can sort of jumpstart the soil ecosystem so that it becomes progressively healthier and more hospitable just by not using pesticides and herbicides um, and chemical fertilizers, but using natural fertilizer and allowing the soil microflora to rebound and become healthier, then these um, microflora um, lead to the health of, of the plants in the soil, the plants being healthier, then incorporate more carbon into their tissue through photosynthesis. And when the plant roots and other parts of the plant die and decompose, the, the healthier microorganisms in the soil, more numerous um, fungi versus bacteria, for example, will then be better able to incorporate nutrients both from the soil and nitrogen from the air into um, into the soil to enrich it and to stabilize in, in sort of aggregate form or little tiny clumps the, um, the carbon material, prevent it from being washed out. The, the uh, soil becomes better able to retain water and um, it, it becomes more hospitable to, to all kinds of 
higher forms of life that depend ultimately on these microorganisms at the, the base of the um, soil food chain and, and the plants. So you have healthier soil, healthier plants, healthier crops, healthier livestock, and healthier people that are interdependent with nature. So that, that's one example of regenerative agriculture technology. I write about Gabe Brown, and I write about John Wick, who uses compost um, on his ranch, and others who are doing the same, Calla Rose Ostrander, for example, uh, who had worked with John Wick in the Marin Carbon Project, Gabe Brown, and at Brown's Ranch in North Dakota. Um, there, are, there are many, many examples, and John Wick- uh, Under a minute, John. Okay, well, there, there's examples in absolutely every segment of the economy, the heavy industry, cement, steel, construction, buildings. We have the technology, we could do it all. We can zero out our carbon emissions. Excellent, very well said. And, and there are wonderful examples in the book of people doing what would solve the climate crisis if it were done on a, on a large scale. The book is called Solving the Climate Crisis, Frontline Reports from the Race to Save the Earth by John Berger. John, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's nice to talk with you, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.